Well, good morning, everyone. Happy New Year. I'm Pastor David, I'm so glad to see you here this morning, whether you're in the room here with us in 2021, if you're joining us online, I just want to say welcome to Appleton Gospel Church. I'm so glad that you're part of this church. Uh, as a church, we believe that the DNA of a Christian life includes active, growing participation in four areas, in worship, community, ministry, and mission. These are our core values as a church, and as a kind of a start to the new year, uh, I, I'd like to focus just briefly on each of these core values, uh, one per week. And so this morning, we're starting off with our value of worship. Now, worship, some of you may have just been participating in worship. Uh, that's worship in the form of singing, in joining together, and singing together for the glory of God. Uh, but worship is more than just singing in a church service. Uh, worship, as we define it, is the whole life response to the glory of God. Seeing and understanding who God is and responding to that. Psalm 96 says this, ascribe to the Lord or give to the Lord the glory due his name. Now the highest and greatest commandment in the Bible we understand and Jesus taught as well is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is about putting God first in your heart and mind and life, and that's why we say that worship is a whole life response to the glory of God. This is what worship is all about. So as a church, our first core value is worship, and hopefully we've already been participating in that value of worship. We've been worshiping the Lord together. Uh, we can worship God through singing and praying, uh, through obeying and giving and serving in every aspect of our lives. I hope that everything we do as a church and everything we do today would just draw your heart deeper in worship of who God is and what he has done. So as we continue, I just have one uh, quick thing I wanna mention for you. So today, if you'd like to give any amount to be able to honor God or to support the ministry of this church, you can do so a couple different ways. You can go to appletongospel.com slash give, and there's some giving options there. You can text an amount you'd like to give to 84321, or you can use the giving boxes on the, near the exits in the room. And I just wanted to mention this because uh, in the next week or so, our bookkeeper, Nicole, and I will be finishing our, our year-end process We'll have uh, annual giving statements sent out to you if we have your email. And uh, if you don't like ever check your email, if you want a paper copy, just let us know. And our printer works as well. We can do that for you. Uh, but we'll have those statements coming out and then also our quarterly financial report coming in the next week or so. And I'm really excited to be able to share uh, where we're at as a church financially. I also just want to say thank you to those of you, to many of you who have been so faithful in giving any amount in 2020. What a year. Uh, we couldn't do what we do as a church without your support. So I'd like to pray, and then we'll, we'll continue in our worship together. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much that you are a God who uh, desires relationships with the creatures that you have made. You, you desire relationship with us. And so in the, in the Bible, in your word, you have revealed yourself to us so that we can get to know you more and get to know more of what you're like and what you like. And also, Father, in your word, we understand better and better who you have created us to be, what you've created for us to do, and how we might have and enjoy a relationship with you. And so this morning, as we kick off a new year, we're thinking new year thoughts, we're thinking about turning over a new leaf, perhaps, we're thinking about some things we should be stopping, some things we should be starting. God, I pray that for this new year, that we, as your people, would continue to grow in a knowledge of what is true about who you are, about your love for us, and all that you would have for us in Christ. Fill us with your spirit, lead us and guide us by your word, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, all year we're focusing on the person and work of Jesus, you might have responded, and if you were Baptist. And today we're continuing a sermon series called What Did Jesus Teach? As uh, I said before the Christmas season, the primary ministry of Jesus before the cross was in preaching and teaching. He would travel around, he would preach and teach to crowds of thousands of people, he would also instruct and guide his disciples in more of uh, quiet and private settings. Jesus was a teacher. 
So what did Jesus teach? That's a very important question for a disciple or a follower of Jesus today. If I'm following Jesus, like what did he teach? Well, before Christmas, we covered some of the many, I'll admit, challenging teachings of Jesus in the, area, in the areas of forgiveness and marriage and singleness and also in caring for the poor. So if you missed any of those, you can go back and watch or listen online if you'd like. Well, today we're kind of picking up this series again, and we're going to continue it on for the next few months because Jesus taught a lot. We have a lot of examples of his teaching in the Bible. Well, today we have an example of the teaching of Jesus that only applies to you if you have the ability to influence another person for good. That, that's the only people I'm talking to today. That's, that's it. The rest of you can take a nap. Uh, author John, John Maxwell defines leadership as this, influence, nothing more, nothing less. Now, I believe that good leadership is using your influence to move someone from where they are to somewhere better. Seen through this lens, we understand that every one of us, every single one of us, rich or poor, strong or weak, extrovert or introvert, has the ability to influence somebody for good. And that might be in some sort of official position of leadership in the church, in the business world, in the marketplace, in education, in healthcare, in government, something like that. Or it might be informal, unpaid, as a parent, as a neighbor, as a friend, as a member of this church. Well, how do we do this? How can we influence other people for good? How can we provide good leadership to people? I think this is a really important question, especially in light of what we have just endured in 2020. All of the turmoil of this past year exposed a real crisis of leadership in our country, around the world. Where were all the good leaders? Well, in Mark chapter 10, Jesus gives us this radical, upside-down view of the nature of leadership. And not only does it help us understand like, how we might be able to grow in our ability to influence other people for good, grow in our ability to be good leaders following the way of Jesus, but more importantly, probably, it gives us insight into how Jesus thought about his own role, his own vocation, his own influence in the world. Jesus was the most influential person in all of human history, unquestionably. How did he do it? How did he think about that? Well, if you have a Bible or a Bible app, please take it and open it to Mark chapter 10, starting in verse 35. Mark 10, verse 35. We'll put the scripture on the screens as well. Let's read together. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him, that is Jesus. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. <laughs> Great question. Uh, actually, it's more of a demand, really. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in glory. You don't know what you are asking. Jesus said, can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, I always want to say, look, look. No. Jesus said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must become your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. This is God's word. Now, this teaching of Jesus comes to us by way of John Mark. And Mark's gospel is the shortest 
gospel. Let me give you a little bit of background on him. The author, John Mark, known as Mark, was on the ministry team of both the Apostle Peter and the Apostle Paul. Imagine that. It's thought that Mark wrote this account largely on the basis of the testimony of the Apostle Peter. Likely, shortly after the execution of Peter, sometime in the mid-60s A.D. So this, is, this record of Jesus' life and ministry comes to us from first-hand eyewitness testimony very early in the Christian movement. Now here, we have this interesting little story about an awkward question or an awkward moment, I think, probably you felt that too, that leads to this fascinating response of Jesus. So let's work our way through this text. Start back at verse 35 with me. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. We have a check. It's blank. We would like you to give it to us, they asked. Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? Now, this little interaction is kind of classic Jesus. It's not the only time he treats people and their interesting conceptions of him and his work in this way. The questions of Jesus are rarely ever asked to gain new information for him. The questions of Jesus are discipleship questions. Now, we just finished a little mini-series on the person of Jesus for Christmas, who, and we examined this, that Jesus was at the same time fully God, the eternal Son of God sent from heaven, and at At the same time, fully man, fully human, facing everything we faced, understanding what we walk, how we walk through life, the good, the bad, and the otherwise. So as God, Jesus sees right to the bottom of the thoughts and motives of our hearts. As much as we try to put an image out there that might be different or slightly better than what's going on in here, God knows what we're thinking. He knows the thoughts and motives of our hearts. So he doesn't need more information. Jesus doesn't need more information about James and John, sons of Zebedee, and what they're thinking about this question. We want you to do for us what we want you to do. Jesus has all the information, is my point. Rather, the questions of Jesus are always designed to expose our hearts, not to him, but to us. What do you want me to do for you? It's a fascinating discipleship question. Because what you want God to do for you exposes so much of what's going on in your heart, good, bad, or otherwise. Well, how do James and John respond? What's the desire of their heart behind this question? Verse 37, they replied, Let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in glory. What does that mean? Well, here they're referring to this full realization of the kingdom of God that will be the future destiny of the Messiah. Now, this answer reveals that the desires of their hearts are both good and bad at the same time, like, well, like myself, many of us. Good Good, because they're affirming their belief that Jesus is the Messiah or the Christ, the anointed one sent by God, sent to do something finally about the problems of sin and death, sent to usher in God's messianic kingdom, the kingdom of God. We believe, they're saying, that you are the king of the kingdom of God, seated on the throne. One day we will see that. Can we just be there? No, no, no. (laughs) Can we like... Be at your right and left. All right, this is not so good. Because in this statement, in demonstrating their faith, their belief in the person of Jesus, who Jesus is, they start jockeying and positioning for power, authority, and influence in that destined kingdom. To be seated at a ruler's right and left hand imply positions of authority and honor and power. Now, in Matthew's account of this scene, Matthew has the mother of James and John present as well, asking a favor from Jesus on behalf of her son. So Matthew records that 
their mom actually kind of initiated this while James and John popped the question. Now, Mark leaves out this detail. Mark's gospel account is much shorter. Probably he didn't include that because it didn't change much of how Jesus answered his disciples. But it does give us some insight into the motive of the brothers. Maybe they didn't concoct this question all on their own. James and John are repeatedly referred to as sons of Zebedee. Who is that? Well, we don't know much about the man Zebedee. But from the fact that everywhere, James and John are known as, by their relationship to him, suggests that their father or maybe their family were likely well-known and influential in their community or maybe even in their country. Some people have this outsized influence. Everyone knows who they are. James and John, you know, sons of Zebedee. We know that he had a fishing business large enough to hire employees other than just his family members. So he ran a business that was fairly large in his time. Perhaps he'd achieved some level of influence or greatness in business or maybe used what he got through his business to influence other aspects of society. Now, perhaps wanting to ensure positions of greatness for her son as well, it seems that it was at the prompting of their mother that this request of Jesus is made. Well, there's nothing wrong, just to be clear, with wanting the best for your kids. <laughs> After all, that's only natural. It wasn't like the mom was evil in her, in her request or something like that. But Jesus reveals something in this conversation that the way of greatness in his coming kingdom is different. It doesn't require the jockeying for power or positions of authority that maybe they were used to in the world. It doesn't require leveraging your relationships with powerful people, calling in favors or politicking in some way. As usual, the way of Jesus is altogether different than the ways of this world. And what Jesus teaches is likely a correction to the way that both James and John, maybe their mom, had in mind in this request. Let's see how he responds in verse 38. You don't know what you are asking. I mean, how often could God respond in that way to our prayers? So many of my prayers, I think God probably would be like, he does not know what he's asking me to do. It's, it's a common, I think, response of God. You don't know what you're even asking. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. We can take it. We can do it. We can, we can keep those positions of authority and power. No problem. We're ready. We've been training for this. Well, Jesus says... In a prophetic moment, you will drink the cup I drink. But these places of honor and authority are not mine to grant. Now, Jesus gets pretty serious here. You don't know what you're asking. You don't understand right now, James and John, that the way to glory is through suffering, and death. The way to resurrection and life is through the cross. My path will lead to glory, Jesus might say, but it will require the greatest of all sacrifices, the costliest gift, giving of the life of Jesus, Son of Man, Son of God, for the sins of the world. You think you can cut in line? You think that maybe just by asking, using our relationship, that maybe you can have the glory without the sacrifice. You don't really know what you're asking. But then Jesus, thinking of their future, knowing what they are destined for, and that that will include, surely, a path that includes great suffering and sacrifice, says his apostles. He says, you will drink of this cup, a cup of suffering, of judgment, of wrath. 
James, likely the older brother of the two, would be martyred soon after the death and resurrection of Jesus, recorded in the book of Acts, put to death with the sword. John would live a long life, surviving several attempts at his execution. He was maybe the only apostle of Jesus that wasn't executed violently in his lifetime. But John's life was not one marked of of comfort and security and health and wealth. He served Jesus at incredible cost in the mission of the gospel, the ministry of the church. But remarkably, Jesus says that it is, is his Father in heaven who grants the places of honor and authority and power in his kingdom. Interesting. If I were one of the disciples, I would have more questions about that. Time out. Jesus, um, tell me more about that coming eternal kingdom, the, the glory part. And you said that the Father in heaven has prepared positions for his people. Tell me more about that. We don't know a lot about that. Tell me more about that. But the disciples can't think straight. Remember what they've just been through. They watch this awkward moment unfold before them. Are they thinking like, Jesus, teacher, teach us more about the coming glory? No, they're indignant. Look at verse 41. When the 10, the other 10 apostles, disciples, became, heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. You think? I mean, imagine if you were there. Hey, Jesus, I know you picked 12 of us. But could two of us be like the greatest of your apostles? Would that be okay? What do you guys think? Don't listen to them. Jesus, what do you say? Can we be at your right and left side? Can my brother and I be like the top apostles? Is that a, is that a position we could occupy? The other 10 are like, wait, what? What? And here we see the destructive effects of worldly Leadership, jockeying and positioning for power doesn't produce flourishing life. It always leads to jealousy and self-interest, and self-interest always leads to more self-interest. If you're caring for yourself, who's caring for me? If you're positioning yourself for power, I lose unless I start positioning for power. Self-interest leads to division and disdain. It divides, be, leads us to become embittered by one another. It's corrosive in life and relationships. Well, how does Jesus respond when this bitter seed is planted in the bed of ego and ambition? How will Jesus deal with this? Brilliantly. Verse 42, Jesus called them together, come here, look, You, I'm just going to say that. Maybe it's in the Greek. Behold, look, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. So Jesus says here that those who hold positions of authority and power, those who are leaders in this world, do what? How do they lead? They lord it over those who are entrusted to their care. They use their position to enforce and coerce their will and punish those who disobey. That's the way of this world regarding leadership. The status of the powerful is raised by their position in relation to those they are leading. You have to go down for me to go up. But Jesus says, not so with you. This is not the way of leadership in the kingdom of God. This is not godly leadership. There is a different way for followers of Jesus. And as usual, as we'll see throughout this whole series, Jesus teaches and models an altogether different way of leadership than the way of the world. Leadership in the world is like this, Jesus says. It's about exercising authority over others, 
beneath you. Instead, leadership in the kingdom of God is about expending or giving of your wisdom, your experience, your resources, maybe your time, maybe your money, your life for others. Whoever wants to become great among you must be a servant. Whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. Now, just as a quick aside about slavery, Jesus isn't saying you can't take this passage and interpret it to mean that Jesus approves of slavery. Why? Well, in his day, slavery was very common and it was much different than what we think of when we think of slavery today. Estimates by historians place the number of slaves as high as 50% of the population of the Roman Empire. And slavery was different in many ways. It wasn't race-based slavery that lasted lifelong, which is what slavery looked like for the past few hundred years. In Jesus' day, it was possible and even encouraged for slaves to be able to eventually purchase their freedom, to work their way out of this relationship, this debt. It wasn't lifelong by nature. But even in Jesus' day, even if it was maybe better in some ways to be a slave at that time, No one would have confused his teaching to mean that being a slave was awesome. Far better. Don't aspire to be a king or a duke or a governor. Like, be a slave. Like, people weren't like, oh, yeah, that makes so much sense to me. People would have been like, what? No one would have thought that what Jesus was teaching about leadership here and influence and service was self-evident. Someone might be a slave to their master or to the king But no one would have wanted to be a slave to all. Another interesting point here is notice that Jesus doesn't dismiss the desire for influence, greatness, power, out of hand. He doesn't say, James and John, what wicked brothers you are. Your hearts are full of evil. Anyone who desires to be great or have influence or some level of power or authority in the world is wrong and wicked. Rather, Jesus says the path to the greatness that you desire, that you have been taught, that you have been shown, that you are following in the world will not take you where you want to go. Not in God's kingdom. You need a different way. The way up in the kingdom of God is down. The way up, the path to greatness, is not about being given a position of leadership, but rather to use what you have, all of what you have been entrusted with, given by God, humbly, what? To serve others, to bless others, to influence others for their good, Wait a second, you might think. Hang on. What Jesus is teaching about leadership is incredibly costly. Jesus, James and John might be thinking, let me get this straight. Are you saying that our desire for greatness will be found in sacrificing our lives for the needs of others, to benefit others, to help others, to love others. I need to put their needs ahead of my own. I need to see myself as their servant. I love the quote from Pastor Larry Osborne on servant leadership. He says, everybody loves the idea of servant leadership until they're treated like a servant. It's costly. It's painful. It doesn't seem immediately clear how my needs might be taken care of if I adopt this posture. It, it might cost me time and maybe money, certainly my energy and effort. All of these things goes from, from helping me pursue my goals and my needs and my desires to help and love and serve and influence you. What could possibly motivate this sort of costly love in influencing and leading those entrusted to our care? What could 
empower? What's the power source, Jesus, behind your teaching here? It's verse 45. It's the gospel. And this changes everything. Look at verse 45. For. This is an explanation. You could say, because. Why would we do this? How could we do this, Jesus? Because of this. For even the Son of Man, that is Jesus, did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. What a fascinating God is God. (laughs) Who would come up with this? The king of all would pay the ransom price for us. The way of glory goes through sacrifice and suffering, Jesus teaches. The way of the resurrection and glory is through the pain and the shame of the cross. The greatest example of servant leadership in the history of the world is Jesus Christ. Why? Well, he was the one who was the eternal son of God, deserving of all the glory, honor, and praise. When the Son of God was born of Mary, born in Bethlehem, all of creation, including not just the shepherds and the donkeys and the things in your nativity scene at home, but the stars and the moons and the planets deserve to kneel and bow before him. He's the one that deserves the sacrifice and service of every human on the planet, if he is our creator. But he's the one who came in humility and weakness, who says, I didn't come to be served as the king. I came as the king to give my life as a ransom, as a payment. Why? To purchase the freedom of the slave. To purchase the freedom of the many from the power of Satan, sin, death, hell, and grave. Mark 10.45 is a beautiful summary of the gospel. Jesus Christ, Son of Man, gives his life for the undeserving so that we might have his life and we might be free to live and to love and to serve and to lead others as he has served us. So how might we apply this to our lives today? What do we do with this teaching? How might we follow the way of Jesus instead of the way of the world in terms of our leadership and our influence in this world? I'd like to leave you with this one thought. I was tempted to preach about 10 sermons in this one sermon this week. Here's the one. Everyone can influence someone for good. Everybody. You. The worldly leader says, I will gladly sacrifice your life and well-being to satisfy my greatest desires. Gladly sacrifice your life. But Jesus says, I will gladly sacrifice my life and well-being to satisfy your greatest needs. This is godly leadership because this is how God leads and loves and serves But it's Jesus' way that has the power not just to influence others for some good, but for eternal, lasting transformation and change and flourishing life. Notice the jockeying for positions of power has stopped as Jesus started to teach. It's his way that has the power to bring the dead to life and shine a light into the darkness of this world. This is the way of Jesus. Because he led like this, he has influenced the rest of history. And it's his way that can be followed in every sphere of your life, in society, in the church, in the home, in the marketplace. It's not just for pastors and ministry leaders. This is for every Christian who has influence in the life of someone. 
Leadership is using your influence to take someone and help them move from where they are to somewhere better. Now, whether you have the ability to influence one other person or 100,000 other people, everyone can influence someone for good. Jesus taught this. Jesus lived this. The greatest king became the greatest servant so that we, as his servants, might be able to love and serve and influence others. Isn't that great? Let's do it. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you have given us a task. And you have said, trust me with the results. We are not jockeying for positions of power as your people. We understand that you have given us far more than we would ever ask or think to ask for in Christ. The inheritance you've given us in Christ of the whole kingdom of God is unfathomably great. Father, would you forgive us when we at times fall back into the worldly patterns of pursuing leadership and leading other people? Father, would you forgive us when we see others primarily as how they benefit us and not in how we might be a benefit to them? Forgive us for the times when we use people for the sake of our big vision or our our glamorous destination. Forgive us for the times when we have failed to lead like Jesus. But Father, I pray for every one of us. We have the ability, we have the God-given ability to be able to influence other people for good. Maybe one or two other people, maybe many. God, we don't know. Help us to be faithful in this task. Give us the tools that we need in terms of wisdom and courage and strength to be able to lead like Jesus. Father, forgive us when we get our egos bruised and bent out of shape, when people treat us as servants. Help us to get back up in faith and peace and love and joy once again to serve others as we have been served by the greatest leader of all time, your son, Jesus Christ. We pray in his name, amen.